Remember, you're being recorded now. Even right now? Even right now. No. Really? Okay, let's get started. <coughs> um, are there any questions for me? This is... This is getting... This information, again, I keep warning you because please study early, study often, ask questions if you don't understand something. Um, if information will start to get more and more complicated, I will, you will be required to, to remember and understand the stuff from, from the first set of exam and, and everything gets built on, okay? That's the way that we designed the class so that by the fifth exam, you're learning everything so that when you take the final, it's actually, that saves you time from not remembering stuff from the first exam because everything is built on something else, okay? So, uh, we were on this, and do you understand the idea of this yes, map? Um, you said the pattern of the lysine modification matters. Did you mean like the order that they're filled in matters? No. Do they so that's what we're going to talk about right now. So, so the idea of, of these lysine being modified, right? The pattern is not the order. The pattern is which lysine is actually modified. And which lysine is actually modified then would dictate which protein is actually going to be recruited to the area. Which protein that's recruited to the area it then indirectly or ultimately leads to these activities. So for instance, if you want if you want cell cycle to continue to go forward, then you would want, let's say, these two lysines to be acetylated leading to these activities, but you don't want then si uh, um, uh, 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 silencing of the heterochromatin if this were, if this area of the gene were, uh, if, if this area of the DNA were to uh, have a gene that is required for cell cycle regulation. Now, in another area, if in another area there is a gene that is required to be turned off so that it doesn't inhibit cell cycle regulation, guess what? You have a different pattern, right? You would have um, lysine number nine being acetylated so that HP1 would be recruited to then silent that hetero, to silent that, that area of the gene, okay? So then, so then the pattern is not the order. The pattern is which, which one of this, which of these lysines will be acetylated. That, that makes sense, okay? We call all of this the histone code. So the pattern, what I call the pattern of, of modification of lysine, that's the histone code. Now again, not just lysine, but arginine and there are others. Okay, so the pattern of modification is the <coughs> histone code. And what does, roughly, what does that tell you? This is really important. Memorize this. Not only memorize, but understand it. <laughs> it, it the histone code then will tell the cell that whether or not this is a, a newly replicated DNA, okay? Or it will tell the cells that, wait a minute, this DNA is damaged, so, so recruit repair system. Uh, this, the, the histone code also uh, tells the cell that this, um, this DNA, this stretch needs to be, uh, this stretch of DNA needs to undergo chromatin remodeling, so therefore uh, a transcription can occur. And then, and, or, or the histone code would tell the cell that this stretch of DNA needs to be uh, folded into the heterochromatin structure so that because these genes, these genes need to be silenced. Okay? Uh, this really only occurs when you're talking about stem cells differentiation, differentiating to more cells, right? So the histone code would, would then direct the cell to do these things. Okay? All, remember, all of this has to do with just the chromosome structure. Restructuring the chromosome will tell the cell to do these things. Okay? Um, 
Um, Bless you. How about DNA? What does modification of DNA do? And we're only going to talk about methylation. And we're going to talk about a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of not types of methylation, but a couple of uh, uh, um, DNA methylation. is not DNA methylation. is not DNA methylation. It depends on where, which part of the DNA is being methylated. Okay? So this is a, a, a perfect, perfect uh, example of the fact that if you were to have a gene, here's a gene, right? And here's another gene, okay? So, and here's the coding region for transcription, and here's a promoter up here. Here's the coding region, here's the promoter. A promoter that is free, no, free of methylation, is usually active or can be active, it can be turned on, okay? So a promoter that is methylated, so a methylated promoter is indicates an inactive gene. That means what? Remember, active, inactive, on versus off. Inactive gene means that, that this gene, the cell is unable to turn on this gene, right? So even with an active gene, remember that the active gene must be turned on as well. So it can't be, an active gene doesn't, doesn't get expressed continuously, okay? So, so if the promoter, now we're talking about the promoter region, if the promoter region were methylated, and we were not talking about just one methyl, uh, uh, methylation event, we're talking about methylated, well methylated, then this gene is silenced, meaning that it is inactive. That's how a gene can be silenced. This is the equivalent of having a gene being in the heterochromatin structure. Right? So now you can silence the gene in two ways. Putting the stretch of DNA or the gene into the heterochromatin structure, or even if it were in the euchromatin structure, you can methylate the heck out of the promoter, and then that would also silence the gene. And then the cell cannot turn it on. How do you turn a, one of these genes on? By actually demethylate or removing the methyl groups first, right? But that still only gets the gene into the active form, but now you have to turn the active form on as well. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, in order to demethylate or remove the methyl groups, uh, the process of differentiation has to occur. A cell, a, a cell cannot change its, and again, this would only happen in stem cells, right? So do you make the connection between stem cell and active versus inactive genes, and, and, and then the mechanism by which a gene is inactivated versus activated? Yes, no, okay. okay. Um, so just what I just said, if this were, let's say, active and you want to inactivate this gene, right, one way to do, and again, only stem cells can do this uh, when stem cells undergo differentiation, then, then the, the promoter can be methylated, okay? The reverse, if this gene were inactive, you can actually reactivate the gene by removing the methyl groups or undergoing demethylation. And again, this can only be done uh, in stem cells, right? Yes, ma'am. So once it's uh, gene methylated, you, uh, the cell have to activate the turn it on. No, so to have to turn it on. Okay. Right. And we'll talk about transcription factors, how to, how transcription factors would turn on or even off um, a gene. Yes, sir. So if you demethylate the gene, will you make it demethylate the promoter region? The promoter. Okay, so you can um, demethylate the uh, promoter and turn it into an active gene because it's still an inactive. No, no, so we're talking about only the promoter. A promoter that has methylation is inactive. A promoter that does not have methylation is active. But then turning on and off is different, which we'll talk about later. Yes, ma'am. And then demethylation is only in stem cells, but methylation? No. <laughs> to, turn, to activate or inactivate, only stem cells can activate or inactivate a gene. Once a, a gene is activate is in the active form, then turning on or off is a, a, a terminally differentiated cell can do that. So again, remember, activating and inactivating gene is 
you're actually changing the pattern of gene expression, right? And a terminally differentiated cell cannot change its pattern of gene expression. Yes? Right. So that's the point. The point is that if you want to change the pattern of gene expression, you have to both turn on the certain genes and, and it activate certain genes and inactivate certain genes. And only stem cells can do that. Right? Only stem cells can differentiate or change the pattern of gene expression. Again, the, these are multiple concepts that, that it, <laughs> this whole slide right here has three different concepts that's put into it. Um, yes, ma'am? So only stem cells can activate or inactivate a gene, but all cells can turn on or off a gene? Right. Uh, only if, only turn on or off an active gene. Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. So those are two separate things. Now, people use the term activate, inactivate. It, it's really complex. So these terms are only for this class. Only for this class, okay? Yes, so the methylation only occurs on the, the bases? Uh, on the bases? On the, on like, so yeah, the cytosine and the... Uh, on, right. On the uh, mainly on cytosine, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So methylation, well, uh, um, um, you mean nitrogenous base, or I'm not sure what... Yeah, the nitrogenous right, bases. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nitrogenous bases. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry about that detail. <laughs> okay. So just know that the the uh, this methylation occurring on the DNA. Okay. We, if you want to, we can talk a lot more about uh, why is it cytosine and not uh, elsewhere. Why why is it on the basis and not on the backbone and all of that. But but don't worry. Too okay. Much. What you do need to worry about is the fact that you can have methylation on the coding regions themselves. But methylation on a coding region has nothing to do with activating or inactivating a gene. In fact, you can have an active gene, but you still have methyl, methylation uh, in the, the coding region, right? So the coding <coughs> region, methylation, um, uh, non-methylated re uh, coding regions has nothing to do with this, and so don't worry about that. What we, again, in terms of talking about active versus inactive gene, we only look at the promoter region. Methylated promoter region means inactive, uh, in, inactive gene. Unmethylated promoter means an active gene. Again, an active gene still needs to be turned on. How do you turn on and off an inactive gene? You don't. That's a trick question. <laughs> you don't. Okay. It is tricky. Okay. So. so. <laughs> What we just talked about, in terms, of, in terms of, not just talk about now, but that, that on Tuesday as well, in terms of restructuring the, uh, reorganize organize the structure of the chromatin or chromosome, as well as methylation of the, of the, um, the, the of various parts of the DNA, you notice that we're not, we're, we're not changing the genotype. We're not changing the sequence of the DNA at all, right? So we call these we, we call these um, 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 really regulate types of regulation epigenetic. Okay. So when you hear about epigenetic, epigenetic changes or alteration, and epigenetic memory, we'll get to memory. But epigenetic alteration or changes means that you change you change um, the the structure of the chromosome, you change the, the, the level and the type of, um, of modification of the DNA, right? You change the pattern of gene expression without, without actually touching or doing anything to the sequence. So you're not changing the genotype. Okay. So then you can tell the cell to produce a certain protein. You can even tell the cell, later on we'll talk about alternative RNA splicing, tell the cell to produce a slightly different pro, a protein for one cell using the one gene, and, and then another slightly different protein using the same gene in another cell. So two cells with the same gene can produce two different, slightly two different proteins. Not gene family, right? We're we talking about the, does that make sense to you? Does that make sense what I'm saying? So gene, gene A, can produce protein 1 and 2, depending on the cell type, right? Oh. So therefore, by producing gene, uh, protein 1 and 2, you're not really changing the genotype, you're changing the regulation of expression, right? So 
So that is referred to epigenetics. This can be remembered. So if your mom or dad has a certain pattern of heterochromatin structure on the chromosome or a certain pattern of metho methylation on the, uh, uh, in the promoter, you actually inherit that too. You, so in addition to inheriting the genome, the, uh, the genotype, you are also inheriting the epigenetic uh, uh, portion of that too. Exactly how that occurs, we don't, we know somewhat according to this slide, but we don't know exactly how that is where, again, memory, so that's epigenetic memory, where, again, let's say, um, you, uh, certain, certain genes in, in your mom, uh, that your mom has, is uh, methylated in the promoter. Well, you would have the same methylation in your promoter in those genes as well. Okay? So there's two different types of genes, of uh, protein, but it's not the same family. Or no, it's uh, okay. Um, 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 we're not talking about gene family. Yeah. We're talking about a gene, and <coughs> later on I'll show you that there are, a, 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 you can have one gene that can, can lead to the expression of uh, 30,000 different proteins, slightly different protein. That's what we're talking about. Hmm. Okay. So it's not, again, it's not gene family. It's one gene that can be used to express different proteins, slightly different proteins. And the regulation of that is through, uh, through regulation. So through either epigenetic memory or uh, epigenetic alterations or other, other means. Okay. So uh, I, I, let's not get into the details right now. So just briefly, just understand what epigenetic uh, alteration or changes are. They're just changes, characteristics that have, that is in addition to the genotype, right? So that means that we're talking about uh, 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 chromatin structure versus methylation of DNA, the two things that we just talked about, right? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Simple. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. What does the prefix epi mean? Is an epithelial? Um, uh, or is it no clone? Epi, epi is outer. So whenever you hear about epiderm, epi anything, it is outer. So beyond. Or, uh, beyond the core. Right? So you have a core, anything epi is on the outside. So genetic, right? Genetic, we think about genotype, phenotype, mm -hmm. right? So genetic. So now this is beyond this genotype. Outside of that. Yeah, okay. outside of that. Okay. So any time that you hear epithelial cells, epi is outside. Right. It's, it's the lining, right? Okay. So take Latin. It's important for biology. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, this is an example of epigenetic, not just alteration or regulation, but also memory is, let's say you have uh, um, uh, a cell, a myoblast, right? a myoblast, which is a stem cell that would can differentiate into uh, muscle cells, like smooth muscle cells. Um, in order to change the pattern of heterochromatin structure, then you have either a trithorax protein present and or a polychrome protein present. The trichlorex protein would bind to the nucleosome. So it would bind to the nucleosome. And what does that do? That actually, uh, by binding, uh, that, that recruits enzymes that would modify the histones, we, we talked about, which then in turn recruit more protein, right? Like the 53 VP protein or the uh, X, XP1, HP1 protein, that then can keep the, that stretch of DNA open. So meaning that euchromatin structure, that active, keep that region active. If you have a polychrome protein, that then 
would recruit. The polychrome protein doesn't do it, but it recruits enzymes that would methylate, methylate, and in this case it's actually methylating the, the histone and not methylating the DNA, would methylate the histones within that nucleosome, then it causes the, the nucleosome to hang on tightly and so thereby preventing, preventing uh, um, uh, um, expression and even might even cause this stretch of DNA to form a heterochromatin. Right? Did that, you follow that? So then, so then, <laughs> so where is the memory part comes from? The memory part comes from is, let's say, let's say you receive, um, um, uh, um, 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 where did this thi uh, uh, trithorax protein come from? If you want a certain pattern to have that particular gene being active, then how does the, your body know that that particular gene has to be active? Well, you would have, re you would have inherited somehow, hand-waving, either the trithorax uh, protein or you would have inherited the fact that the trithorax <coughs> protein is actually active, right, from one of your parents. That's the memory part from one of your parents, so that now in your cell, in your fertilized egg, that the trithorax protein is now present versus it's not present. And again, this is hand waving because obviously it's more complex than that, and we don't understand exactly how that occurs. But if you, let's say for simplification, if you inherited the trithorax protein, then these genes are active. If you inherited the tri uh, polychrome proteins, then these these, uh, uh, then you have inactivated gene. Again, it's obvious it's, it's more complex than that because you have 24,000 genes, and so how does the trichlorax pro protein know which gene is to turn on, right? <laughs> it's, it's a lot more complex. We, again, I don't know at least, but people are still trying to figure out exactly how that's regulated. But do you kind of have a sense of what that means by epigenetic memory? Okay, yes ma'am. It's not. So then how does that work? We don't know. I don't know. I don't know a lot. You, you pay to have somebody who doesn't know a lot tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so if you inherited the trichloric protein, it would know to recruit enzymes, to modify histones, and what? And then keep them open, just what this says here. Versus polycomb proteins would also recruit enzymes that modify the protein, modify the histone code, right, to keep the, the, the chromatin closed. So one is to keep it open, one is to keep it closed. Keeping it open means that the, this gene is active. Keeping it closed means that this gene is inactive. So for simplification, that's all that you need to know. I do a lot of talking so that hopefully you understand, but at the end of the day, that's all that you need to know. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the polychrome protein, that will always fold it up into the heterochromatin. Right, exactly. That's the point. Is so that always. It, it, exactly. So trithorax protein always is related to open nucleosome, however it does it, which, which then relates to, correlates to active gene. Polychrome protein um, equals or connect, correlates with a closed... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a closed structure and equals inactive gene. That's really, at the end of the day, that's all that I need you to know. Okay, yes, ma'am. So, epigenetic is something that, it means that we inherited? Right, you inherited that pattern, but not changing the sequence of the DNA. Yes, sir. Well, it would be safe to say that um, polychrome is mostly It's just structure. This is both structure. O open, right? Euchromatin, another way of saying it, trichlorothorax protein correlates to euchromatin. Polychrome protein correlates to heterochromatin. How's that? That's, that's easier to... Uh, and both are, of course, related to function, right? One is active, one is inactive. Okay? I, 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 I'm... I'm, I'm happy to answer all these questions because <laughs> this is why you show up to class, right? Okay, here's another way to explain or an, an added piece to explain epigenetic memory. 
there are two different types of methyl transferase races, meaning methyl DNA methyl transferase. A methyl transferase is the enzyme that adds methylate methyl group, right? So a, a me tra methyl transferase is an, an enzyme that actually carry out methylation. Versus, if you ever hear of the term methylase, that's actually an enzyme that removes uh, me the methyl group. So we'll just concentrate on methyl transferase, which is it carries out me uh, methylation. There are two types. One is called the noble methylase, uh, methyl transferase, and the other one is perpetuating um, uh, methyl transferase. The noble means new, from scratch, versus perpetuating means it continues. So whenever you see this, remember that perpetuating correlates with memory. It continues. So an added piece of epigenetic memory is that you will have perpetuating methyltransferase and its activity and from your, from your parent and your cells will remember that these perpetuating methyltransferase then will remember which promoter to methylate, right? From your parents to you. So when it, when it comes to, to Epigenetic memory, it involves perpetuating methyl transferase. When we talk about DNA, right? The, tri um, the trichlorex protein and the polycomb protein uh, uh, refers to the structure of the chromosome. This refers to, uh, um, refers to modification of the histones. This refers to modification of the DNA. Okay? So perpetuating correlates with epigenetic memory. The normal methyl, methyl transferase Correlates with correlates with um, uh, uh, just um, pattern uh, uh, the, the change in pattern of gene expression in in you. So it has nothing to do with memory. It has to do with you. Okay. And so a stem cell, a stem cell that divides and differentiates would activate the de novo methyltransferase, not the perpetuating methyltransferase, unless. <laughs> Unless the, the stem cell also wants the differentiated cell to remember that certain genes have still have to be inactive. Yes? Yes? So it's not just passing memory from your parents, memory from the stem cell down as well. Okay? So memory, again, always memory is perpetuating. Anything new, change of pattern is the noble. Yes, sir? Yes? Exactly what I just said. Yeah, okay. So, kind of, so anytime you see perpetuating methyl transferase, perpetuating means memory, right? So then the memory could be the memory of of inactivating a certain gene, either remember from your parents to you, or or the memory from a stem cell to a terminally differentiated cell. Still memory. So anytime there's a memory of inactivating a gene, you, you, you're, you're, you have to think about perpetuating methyltransferase. Versus the NOVA methyltransferase has to do, is new from scratch. So it has to do with the change in the pattern of gene expression. Right? A stem cell, or even your parents' parental cells, but let's say a stem cell, want to differentiate into a terminally differentiated cell. Some genes are activated, some genes are inactivated. The genes that are inactivated must use, or that used to be active, must use the de novo tra methyl transferase. The genes that, that were inactive in the stem cell and also continue to be inactive in the daughter cell will use the perpetuated methyl transferase. Right? So now I just introduced two examples of epigenetic memory. One uh, one looking at the chromatin structure or chromosome structure, the other one looking at uh, the regulation at the DNA level. So whenever a cell has to differentiate from another cell, it should use the perpetuate. Right. Yeah. That's by the name. <laughs> to perpetuate, that's very good. Right. Right. Hence the name. Okay, so far so good. All right, let's get to this is actually
actually my absolute favorite part of uh, science, period, not just biology, but just my area of research, transcription factors. So transcription factors, by definition, are proteins. All transcription factors are protein number one. Proteins to do what? Proteins to regulate transcription. Hence, transcription. <laughs> okay. So these are proteins that regulate. They don't, they don't, um, right, they, they just regulate, right? Some of trans, some transcription factors actually um, um, activate transcription and some actually inactivate. Okay? And you have hundreds, hundreds of them out there. And most of them are activating transcription factors. A few are in, uh, in, inhibiting transcription factors, right? We lump them all into the term transcription factors. Um, in this class, we'll talk mainly about the activating transcription factor. So we're more concerned with turning on a, a, a transcription uh, or turning on a gene. Remember, I didn't say activating, but turning on a gene. Uh, and not so much worry about turning off a gene. Okay? I'll try to talk louder. Okay? For transcription factors, there are two major families two major types, and it, this is really, really important, okay? Uh, probably a good three or four questions will be on this slide. The two major families or groups of transcription factors, one is called the TF2 family. Now let me kind of explain this a little bit. Actually, it's, it's really, these are really called the general transcription factors, general, like overall general, okay? General transcription factors, the, the, which is equals to TF2 transcription factors, okay? Here's where TF2 comes from. TF obviously stands for transcription factors. Two refers to the fact that these are transcription factors that regulate the activity of RNA polymerase 2. Now, there are three types of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. Right? Each type of poly, uh, uh, RNA polymerase would carry out the transcription of a different type of RNA. Remember, there are about 12 or so different RNAs. Right? So RNA polymerase 2 is the only RNA polymerase that can synthesize mRNA. And since we're going to focus on mRNA, we'll talk about TF2s. Does that make sense? But TF2s, again, TF2s are general transcription factors. So far, so good? So that's one type of transcription factor. This man is over there. mRNA, right, right. Messenger RNA. <laughs> oh, that was my yes, question. Uh, RNA polymerase to, is it? Uh, what is it again? I don't know what the question is. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. So, so RNA polymerase two is responsible for synthesizing messenger RNA. Is that good? Yeah. Thank you. That that Texas twang comes out. Okay. So that's one type up here. The other type is referred to as tissue specific, or more specifically, actually cell specific. Transcription factor. So, in order to kind of, not, if you just say transcription factor, nobody knows what you're talking about. Okay. So, don't even if you say TF, nobody knows what you're talking about. So, you have to distinguish between cell or tissue specific TF or transcription factor or TF twos. So, the general transcription factors will just will we'll just um, um, shorten it to TF two. Does that make sense? Okay. In general. In, in a very general sense, what is the difference between the two family of transcription, transcription factors? TF2s, right? Well, first of all, what do both of them do? How do they regulate transcription? They, they, um, they recognize and bind to response elements. Remember response elements? Response elements are also called, called consensus sequences or promoter sequences, okay? So these are sequences that are mainly found in promoters. They're found elsewhere as well, and we'll talk about it. But mainly found in promoters, or just there. Um, how about how about this? Transcription factors recognize and bind 
response elements, and response elements are short sequences, short regulatory DNA sequences. How's that? Okay. Short regulatory uh, DNA sequences. So far, so good. So again, trans all transcription factors must recognize and bind to response elements of some kind. And response elements are short regulatory DNA sequences. Some of them are found in the promoter, but they can be found elsewhere as well. So far, so good? Okay. So when TF2s recognize and bind to response elements, what, what their job, all of them, every single last one of them, what their job is, is to recruit RNA polymerase 2. So if you have a gene, right, that is ready to, naked DNA that is ready to, to, be, um, to, to be used as a template for transcription, but RNA polymerase 2 is out here somewhere, so you have to recruit the RNA polymerase 2 to the site, right? Then that's the job of TF2. To bind to response elements, and then to recruit um, um, RNA polymerase 2. The cell or tissue specific to TFs or transcription factors um, have more, uh, 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 um, varying functions, okay? The, one of those ma major functions is to actually activate RNA polymerase 2. So RNA polymerase 2 has to be recruited, but now, even if it's recruited, it has to be activated. Again, activating RNA polymerase 2, not activating the gene. <laughs> By activating RNA polymerase 2, then you are actually initiating or turning on the gene. Gene ex turning on gene expression. Does that make sense? I know these terminology, they're a little more complex, so if it do that doesn't make sense, let me know. So again, tf 2 recruit RNA polymerase 2, and cell-specific or tissue-specific transcription factors turn on RNA polymerase 2. Yes, ma'am? Um, when it turns on the RNA polymerase 2, that just initiates, right, not actually turning on initiate to turn on the gene expression? No. Literally turn on. So once RNA polymerase 2 is turned on, now it synthesizes the RNA. Okay. Yes, sir? Yes. And an active gene, what are some of the characteristics of an active gene? How about that? How about that? that this is, uh, you give some some something for you to hang on. Uh, two characteristics of an active gene is one, it must be found in the euchromatin region. Two, the promoter cannot be methylated. We talked about those two, right? So they're active. Does that mean that the cell continue to recruit RNA polymerase two? No, it's just active. It's just open. That's active. Okay, but turning on means that. The, the cell would only carry out gene expression or transcription, right, when the gene is on. And, and we're, we're talking about how to turn on the gene expression, how to turn on gene expression right now, right? So talking about transcription factors, this is, this is talking about how to turn on gene expression. But, they, but only active genes can be turned on. So inactive genes cannot be turned on. So inactive genes cannot, cannot recruit transcript, uh, TF2s or cell-specific transcription factors. So you can have an unmethylated active gene, but it's not turned on unless RNA uh, polymerase 2 is recruiting uh, uh, unless <coughs> Unless TF2s <coughs> bind TF2 to recruit RNA polymerase, polymerase 2. Perfect. You, you just said it. You okay. nailed it on the head. Exactly what he just said. So repeat that and then you'll be fine. Right? That, that is perfect. <laughs> that is good. Okay? Are we still? Now, again, we'll just keep it a secret in this class, right? Those are terminologies we use. When you go research and people use turning on, turning off, activate, inactivate, just, it, it's just really confusing, uh, depending on the context. So you need to understand the context whenever you hear, you talk to somebody, right? They might say activate, but mean turning on. Or they might say activate, and they really mean activate. <laughs> so, so... Uh, according to our definition. So be real careful. Everything has to be said in context of something else, okay? Back to this. Okay. Uh, 11.45, right? <laughs> okay. I'm, 
a little slow, so uh, let me, uh, no, I, I won't speed up. Okay. So that's one function of the uh, uh, um, <coughs> tissue-specific transcription factors is to turn on. Only after RNA polymerase 2 had been recruited, right? So without being recruited, there's no turning on. Okay. We're assuming that the DNA is naked. That's the only way that TF2 can recognize and bind to the DNA, to response elements in the DNA. But what happens if you have a, a, a protein, a, a, a chromatin chromosome that's folded into the euchromatin structure? You, the cell has to undergo chromatin remodeling to begin with, right? What directs the cell to undergo chromatin remodeling? That's one question. The next question is, actually, the same activity is true with inactivating a gene, where what directs the cell to actually goes into, into the heterochromatin structure by regulatory proteins. We already saw one of those regulatory proteins that causes a cell to, to go into the heterochromatin structure. That's the polycomb protein, right? We just talked about that, right? But in order for a, a euchromatin structure to undergo chromatin remodeling to open up to get to the naked DNA, that requires the binding of tissue-specific transcription factors. So that's the second major activity of tissue-specific transcription factors. Not only are they required to turn on RNA polymerase 2, only after RNA polymerase 2 had been, had been recruited, but way before that, upstream from that, chromatin remodeling has to occur to begin with, and that is also the, the function of tissue-specific transcription factors. Now put all the pieces together. <laughs> Here's what happens. Okay, uh, 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 a gene that is free of methylation in the DNA and and it found in the uh, um, e structure. Right now, the cell the, the cell is told that that gene has to be uh, in, uh, to be expressed. Let's say uh, a cell normally doesn't want to divide. Now it's told to divide. Right. So then. So then. Uh, remember the lysine mod, the lysine, so this is a new way that I'm trying to explain this, I see if this works. So now, now you have that stretch of gene, okay? And, and now the cell is told to go through the cell cycle to divide. So therefore, that, this particular gene needs to be expressed, okay? That means that, in our example, lysine residue 79 has to be expressed, I and mean, it has to be acetylated. So to recruit 53BD, so that indirectly cell cycle regulation can occur. So far so good? How does a cell know to recruit the enzyme to acetylate lysine, this lysine 79? This is acetylation. This has nothing to do with your parents passing this on down to you or a stem cell, right? This is a cell that's all, this is a gene that's already active, so there's no memory involved. So that's, 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 the, that, that, that's the hint, no memory. So how, I just told you, I just told you the answer. Tissue specific, tissue specific transcription factors would bind to this area, recruiting what, recruiting the, the acetyl transferase to, to, Acetylate lysine number seven, uh, lysine seventy nine, okay. so that the acetylated lysine seventy nine would recruit fifty three BP, leads leads to the expression of the whatever this protein is, and we'll talk about it in a few in the uh, third or fourth exam. That then would lead to that this particular protein then would lead to cell cycle regulation. That's how everything. That's how everything. And then once once that's that recruitment is done, then in order to actually, so, and then this would only lead to chromatin remodeling, right? But then TF2s have to bind to this region, recruiting RNA polymerase 2, and then more tissue specific transcription factors, maybe different tissue transcription factors, tissue specific transcription factors would bind, and then to turn on RNA polymerase 2. So that's what I mean by multiple steps. Repeat, yes. Oh, no, just where the, um, where the tissue specific would bind to? Just to the area. 
So in order to, so the idea is, don't worry about exactly where, but the idea is in order to even get the cell to undergo chromatin remodeling, tissue-specific transcription factors has to bind to a response element, right, which is not within the promoter, response element, a regulatory DNA somewhere in this area, so that the, the uh, histone acetyl transferase can be recruited to acetylate lysine number 79. And then from there, we already talked about that. Yes, ma'am, uh, over there. That, that was it. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, are we good? So again, I'm, I'm going back and forth because we're putting the pieces together. And hopefully, in the past, I just zoomed by, and now I'm trying to see if this works. So if it works and your average goes all the way through the roof, then I know that I'm doing my job. If not, then I have to read and do it another way. Yes, ma'am. So in this case, it's the tissue-specific transcription factor that is the comes first, and then yes. the... No, uh, no, the, uh, that, that's it. And no, there's just, no then. Just before, right? There's no then. Okay. Right. So, so without adding what type of proteins, so let me go through the steps again, okay, without, without talking about transcription factors and everything. So the gene that is active in the euchromatin structure, right, the euchromatin structure needs to be no methylation, so active means that, by definition, active means that, uh, in the promoter. <laughs> a, an active gene in the euchromatin structure, in order for it to be expressed, the very first thing is chromatin remodeling. How that's done, you already know. Second thing is recruitment of RNA polymerase 2. And the third thing is activate RNA polymerase 2. And how all of those things are done is through transcription factors. Does that simplify things a little bit more? <laughs> so I didn't even have to say all the other stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's really in the explanation, I think. But, but my guess is if I didn't say any, any of the other stuff and I just summarized it, you probably wouldn't understand. So... That's what I think, but you know, you tell me. I'd like to talk, but I don't have to talk that much. So if you want me to shorten everything, I would be more than happy to do it. A lecture would be only half an hour long. <laughs> okay, are we good? So that's where we are. That's where we are. Okay? And that's this is the very important slide. So remember this, understand this talk about it. Um, memorize, the, no, don't memorize this. Just examples <laughs> of, of um, uh, tissue-specific transcription factors, as you notice, di different ones leads to, leads to different um, activities. Like that. Okay? There are lots, hundreds of them. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Just, again, give you an example of what I just said. So you have a uh, response element uh, recruited by uh, uh, and, and bound by TF2s. The TF2s then, general transcription factor TF2s then re recruit RNA polymerase 2, and then the cell-specific or tissue-specific transcription factors would bind to some more response elements, different response elements, to turn on RNA polymerase 2, and then that's how, and then, then you have transcription, okay? Two more things <laughs> when we talk about tissue or cell spe specificity, okay? And we'll, we'll look at this later on, but let me warn you and, and briefly, uh, briefly um, uh, talk about it and then more details later. So, so a cell, a cell would only express a certain gene, right? And the reason why it expressed that, that certain gene is because of two types of specificity. One is that not all cells, why wouldn't a cell, why would a cell not express a certain, a certain gene? It's because that gene may not, each, the promoter of each gene only has a certain number and type of response elements. So far so good? Right? So follow me. A promoter, let's say, would have 12, 12 response elements. 
right? And there are hundreds of different types of response elements. So obviously, the 12 are limited into in what type of response element. So far, so good. And each response element is only is only recognized and bar, bound by a very specific <coughs> tissue specific transcription factors. So far, so good. So therefore, therefore, it really it, and then tissue transcription factors. The reason why they're tissue specific is because only very specific cells would actually synthesize these tissue-specific transcription factors. So far so good? So only tissue, only very specific cell, a particular cell, will synthesize a particular transcription factor, tissue-specific transcription factors that will bind to a specific response element. And only in that cell will the gene be expressed because of that specificity. Perfect example is, let's say, uh, um, 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 uh, muscle cells. There is a transcription factor, tissue-specific transcription factor called MyOD. Okay? Don't have to write this down. This is just an example. We'll see it later. MyOD, right? Um, uh, promoters only, only stem cell or, or skeletal muscle cells would have uh, would produce MyOD. And MyOD would only bind to the MyOD response element. And only, and, and therefore, obviously, then, only the gene that contains the MyOD response elements are, uh, are turned on, right? So far, so good. Then, so that's it. So only, skeletal, it's only muscle cells, stem cells, can produce MyOD. So only MyOD. Uh, so therefore, the, ge the gene that contains the myoD response elements only those are turned on. Oh, those are turned on only in muscle stem cells or muscle cells because of the specificity with myoD. Yes. So specificity is not only again only at the level of cell specific uh, transcription factors or tissue specific transcription factors, but also in terms of the actual the presence of the response elements in the gene itself, okay? We'll, we'll look at an uh, example um, later on, either today or, or on Tuesday. All right, so we, uh, when uh, RNA polymerase uh, two and then all the transcription factors bind, you have transcription, in, you, in the whole thing is called the transcription initiation complex. Remember DNA replication, transcription, translation, um, there are three different stages or levels, uh, uh, um, yeah, three different stages, right? All of them would have the initiation uh, um, stage, elongation stage, and termination stage. And so far, we just talked about initiation stage. Okay? Up, everything up to now is the initiation of transcription. As soon as RNA polymerase starts synthesizing RNA, we enter the elongation stage and we're not really going to talk much about it. Okay. More. <laughs> to add complexity to all of that, are we okay with actually the basic stuff? Yes? Do you already know all this stuff, by the way? Do I need to explain it in this much detail? Yes? No? Yeah. You already know like all it. this? Okay. Well, explain it. <laughs> explain? Okay. Just burn up some time, right? <laughs> In addition to the promoter, there are different sequences that are promoter-like. One of which is an enhancer, an enhancer, an enhancer sequence, or an enhancer. Okay, an enhancer is promoter-like. That means that it's probably um, about the same size, between 300 and 1,000 base pairs or so. And an enhancer also contains response elements. <laughs> So it's just like you take the promoter, right? The enhancer is basically a promoter. However, the difference between an enhancer and a promoter and then also other sequences that we won't talk about is the fact that instead of the promoter being immediately upstream from the gene, right? Immediately upstream from the gene, the, the enhancer is actually far away from the gene. Either far away in the same chromosome or actually for and in sometime can be in a different chromosome. Okay? So by definition, an enhancer is a promoter-like sequence 
but it's found very far away from that particular gene that it needs to regulate. Okay? And the enhancer can actually regulate multiple genes, whereas the promoter can only regulate that, that coding sequence. So that's the other difference. Do you understand the differences, the, uh, the two differences between the two? So the okay. promoter is more specific? To that one gene. To that one gene. Okay. Okay. So, so, uh, so the enhancer could uh, regulate virus? I haven't said anything about it regulating, so I'll, I'll explain what it does right, right now. Okay. So, so far, those are the two differences, right? right. So, but the, what does the enhancer do? The enhancer would contain response elements. And what do response elements do? They are recognized and bound by transcription factors. In this case, the enhancer, the response elements of the enhancer can only be recognized and bound by tissue-specific transcription factors. Another way of saying that, that is that TF2s can only recognize and bind to response elements in a promoter. TF2s doesn't bind anywhere else. TF2 does not bind to the enhancer sequence. The enhancer. Okay. So again, the enhancer contains response elements that are recognized and bound by uh, tissue-specific transcription factors. Yes, ma'am. Um, you just. Okay. Okay. And what does that do? <coughs> well, well, let's say this red thing is bound by this is a tissue-specific tra transcription factors, and the enhancer is somewhere else. What that does is that that causes the the, the chromosome to fold back so that the trans tissue specific transcription factors can bind to both the enhancer and the RNA polymerase. All right? I'm sorry? The binding. It just folds and binds. Affinity. Okay? If the enhancer were in another chromosome, that chromosome will kind of settle down right next to that gene as well. Okay? Why do that? <laughs> it's, it's, it's. So, um, so here's the scenario. There are there are different per permutation of this scenario, but the scenario is: remember, I said that there are activating transcription factors, tissue specific, and inhibiting transcription factors, right? So let's say, without looking at the enhancer, uh, the enhancer, you have transcription factors that bind, that bind to this area. Let's say these two things. Let's say one is an in an activating transcription factor, the other one is an inhibitory or inhibiting transcription factor. So far, so good, right? So now, and they're both of equal strength. So, so one one tells the RNA polymerase go ahead and 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 go, and the other one said no, no, you, you shouldn't go yet, right? So, so then RNA polymerase doesn't know what to do. So, in order to tip the balance, another another tissue specific transcription factors bind to the enhancer and then they, and then fold back and then that will that binding will then truly activate the RNA polymerase too and then transcription can occur. This is that's just one scenario. There are different permutations of that scenario. So so the enhancer the uh, enhancers that are bound by tissue specific transcription factors can enhance the signal. Sometimes an RNA polymer, uh, polymerase 2 can be activated and carry out transcription. But, remember what we, again, integration of information. Remember what we said about, about the fact that, um, that um, as long as the DNA, the stretch of gene, the promoter is remained open, then more RNA polymerase 2 can be recruited, right? So another scenario could be that the enhancer sequence can fold back and allows for the promoter region to be open longer. So without the enhancer sequence folding back, transcription can still occur, but only for a very short period of time. But with the enhancer sequence folding back, then, then that enhances, right, enhancer, enhances the, the transcription process, so more more transcripts or more RNA can be produced. So those are two scenarios of why the enhancer sequence is, is um, pretty important. Right? 
Is it absolutely necessary to have an enhanced sequence? No. It's absolutely necessary to have the promoter. It's absolutely necessary to have the coding region. But enhanced sequence just adds to it. Right? That's why, again, it's enhancing. Enhanced sequence can never, ever turn on by itself, turn on a, uh, a, um, um, a G. Enhanced sequence can never, ever by itself activate RNA polymerase 2. It can only enhance the activity. Yes, sir. It happens very often. <laughs> so most of the time, actually, you will have... Later on, when we talk about the fact that think, okay, more globally, think about a cell. Right? Think about a cell, the fact that a cell receives, and we'll give the examples later on of the extreme, a cell receives hundreds, sometimes thousands of information at the same time. Right? So let's say there are only about 100 of you in here. But all of you talk at the same time. Each one of you want me to do something. Each group of you. So a few of you would like me to stop talking, just shut up. A few of you <laughs> want me to talk more. A few of you want me to talk louder, right? And so I can't do all of those things at the same time, right? Sometimes what you want to tell me are opposing things, like tell me to talk louder, and then you up here, you want me to talk softer, right? So what do I do? I can only do one thing. So whom should I, to whom I should listen? To whatever signal it is that is the clearest, the strongest to me. So if you talk really loudly, say, don't talk anymore, then I won't talk anymore, right? If you just kind of whisper. So this, is that a good analogy? So in terms of a cell, that's what happens is that, that it receives a bunch of different signals a lot of it has to do with the expression of transcription factors or activation that would regulate gene expression. And so you have an activating versus inhibitory, and then whichever is stronger, whichever signal is stronger would win out. And this happens almost all the time when we talk about gene expression. Okay. We'll, we'll encounter that more. So there's, there's more to it. Um, we zip through. We talked about this already. Um, uh, this idea, the, the idea about if you keep the, the, the promoter <coughs> open longer, you have more transcript. If you have more transcript, you should have more proteins at the end, right? So that's the idea. Now, this is not always the case, so we'll, we'll encounter this again, but the idea is that if you want a lot of proteins, then you might want to open, open uh, keep the, the promoter open a lot longer. Okay. So when you say sterility, it's the... By keeping the promoter open longer, that's what I mean by stability. Ah, here's... Here's the... Here's the example that I gave you about myo D is another example that should show up on your exam. Hint, hint. Okay? So, you have a protein, and don't worry what really what this protein is. Pack 6, even if you don't have it memorized, don't worry about it. Is this a gene, and this gene is only expressed in, in in four different cell types: pancreas, lens and cornea, neurotube, retina. Neurotube, not even in your brain cells right now, right? Only in the neurotube, so only during embryogenesis. This gene, and by the way, uh, and, and I forgot to say something. Some Response elements can actually be found in the coding region, by the way. So, so response elements can be found in the promoter, can be found in enhancers and other sequences, and a lot of time can be found in the actual coding region as well. Okay? Uh, and for the most part, they're actually found in the intron and not the exon. So the coding region for transcription, but not the coding region for amino acid. So again, I digress. So, there are all, these four, the reason why, the reason why um, uh, PAC6 is only expressed in these four tissue type is because there are, there are, um, uh, there are only four response elements that's relate, right? There are, uh, 
there are response elements that are that are specific for these four tissue types. So there's a response element that would you would tell the cell to produce express this gene in the pancreas versus the lens and cornea and so on and so forth. So far so good. So that's what I just said earlier. Not only that, but even even if you have these response elements, what has to, what what is the other thing that has to happen? That all, these are the only four cell types that actually can express the cell specific transcription factors that then would be able to recognize and bind to the response element. Right? So again, not only do you have to have the specific response elements, but that cell also needs to have a specific uh, um, uh, transcription factor to bind. The two have to go hand in hand. What happens if you accidentally, accidentally have a hepatocyte, a liver cell, that expresses a tissue-specific transcription factor that can bind to the, that can bind to um, 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 one of these, one one of these um, uh, um, response elements? Then it would activate the gene. Right? That would activate the gene. So it has to be. So the cell doesn't know that it's a pancreatic cell, really. It doesn't know that it's in the pancreas. It doesn't know that it's in the neuro tube. It all, it's all molecular. Right? It's all molecular. Does that kind of sort of show you another view of that? Yes, sir. So it would, it would activate it even though it came from... Even though it came from the liver, right? Because, again, it doesn't, it's not labeled, right? The liver cells doesn't go, doesn't go around and say, hey, I'm a hepatocyte. It doesn't do that. It's only <coughs> molecules. Whatever molecules that it has, right, is what is, that's how it functions. Okay. So again, that, that's the idea of stem cells and people talking about, well, you can take a certain cell and if you do the right thing to it, you can turn a, a hepatocyte into a neuron, which theoretically you can because it's all molecular, right? So a cell is not branded as something just because it looks good. It's branded as that because of the molecules that are being expressed in it. And molecules structure function. Molecules would transform the cell into a certain structure, therefore it has a certain function. Okay? So that, that's, I like this slide a lot, it's, it's fantastic, so know that. Somewhat know this. So, in addition, this is very specific for Pax six. Is the fact that it's a a positive feedback loop. Most of the time, feedback loops are actually negative. So, if you have enough of the product, it would turn off the pathway. And in this case, it perpetuates. So, so once Pax six is turned on, which produces Pax six, Pax six then can turn around and be used as a transcription factor itself. So PAC6 is actually a tissue-specific transcription factor that when it's made, it, it goes back and turns on itself, so it continues to make PAC6. Okay. So therefore, when we talk about pattern of gene expression, that darn word again, pattern of gene expression, a stem cell would not be a pancreatic cell, right? It's a stem, stem cell to pancreatic cell, but somehow there's a change in gene expression that would tell that particular pancreatic, the stem, stem uh, precursor to the pancreatic cell to express that particular cell specific tissue, cell specific transcription factor that turns on PAC6. Now that stem cell become pancreas because now PAC6 is going to be expressed continuously. You see how, how those things integrate, how stem cells and regulation and specificity and regulation of expression leads to the, the, the formation of the pancreas, right? And that's what this is saying, okay? All right, uh, a few more. I, I want to use the rest of the time, if you don't mind. Okay, well, I'm gonna go through many of these very quickly. I don't need you to memorize, uh, again, the, the numbers or anything. You realize that most, in most classes, practically all classes that you take, you talk about, we talk about mRNA, right? But mRNA only constitutes 3 to 5% of all the RNAs in the cell. So we're yeah, talking about, 
we're talking about a very small number, but a very important number. But do realize that. Uh, what else is there? We already talked about the fact that ribosomes are structure function, conservation of structure conservation function. Ribosomes are really important. Okay? Um, we already talked about the fact that there are three different types of RNA polymerases, and each one would carry out the synthesis of a different RNA. Um, example of how uh, ribosomal RNA, all RNAs also undergo uh, modification. Uh, that list of RNAs, again, that you don't need to memorize. Uh, and again, this reiterate the fact that, yeah. don't try to memorize this, but do realize that RNA polymerase 2, uh, um, in addition to synthesizing um, um, mRNA, can synthesize some of the other RNAs as well. Right? Don't, again, don't, don't memorize it. Realize that fact. Okay? Cell specialization. Let me see. Uh, okay, cell specialization in terms of proteins. We just finished our talk about cell specialization in terms of RNA. Are there any questions about that? Clear as a bell or clear as mud? Um, go back, think about it, digest. And then I'll see you next week. How's that? Sounds good. Have a great weekend, everyone.